Hello everyone, back tuning in to the summer 2016 forecast from GasWeathers.com. Over the past three months, we've been looking at the long-range seasonal models and also looking at analogues to uh, build up a picture of how the patterns are evolving as we move towards summer. Now you're going to have to put it all together. You've got to put the models together with the analogues and try to come up with a forecast for the summer. Um, this is one of the hardest seasons I've ever had to predict. Summer is always a tricky season anyway, but this one is proving very, very difficult. And I'll talk you through everything that we've been looking at in a moment before we eventually arrive at the forecast uh, from gasovis.com, and you'll see why this has been such a challenging one uh, to bring together. But before I get on with that, just very quickly to say about the ads, there's links to articles on all the pages. Have a browse through the widgets and click through the links if there's any articles that you're interested in. And thanks very much for doing that. There's video ads on most of the pages, which own our content when you watch them on Close Back Up Again, helps to pay for our website. Uh, later on, just a bit of a plug for later on, we're going to have a quick sneak peek at autumn because now that we're getting the summer forecast out of the way, the, um, the train rolls on to the next destination, which is going to be the autumn. And that's going to be the long range uh, look aheads so that we start doing from next month. Um, we'll be doing autumn updates. So we'll have a quick sneak peek of that this afternoon. Uh, just say it could be quite a long video. So uh, get yourself a comfy chair, maybe a cup of tea and a few biscuits. We have some time. If you can't watch only one sitting, don't worry. We went, the video will be kept on the website indefinitely. This will be placed onto the summer uh, forecast page with a written summary of everything that we discuss and the forecast uh, to go with it. So uh, if you can't watch it only one go, don't worry. So the um, storyline for the summer updates really began right at the start of the year with uh, events in the Pacific Ocean. So I'm going to start with this chart, which is the um, anomaly chart from NOAA uh, from January, back in January at the start of the year. And of course, then we had uh, El Nino taking place. A big El Nino event was going on through the winter, and that is indicated by those vibrant red colours from Peru over towards Indonesia over there. So we know we had this very strong El Nino, possibly record-breaking El Nino event at the start of the year. That faded very quickly, though, as it always does, through the early part of the year. And then we've got to start thinking about where we go beyond El Nino. Very often after an El Nino, uh, after a warm event in the Actor Pacific Ocean, you will get a cold event. You'll get La Nina. And uh, this is a great indication from 2007. This is May 2007. This is a great example of a La Nina. Notice all of this blue here in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, that was just the start of a La Nina event, but it was a very big event that occurred during the, summer, uh, during the summer of 2007. Now, these years that are transitioning from El Nino to La Nina, from a warm event to a cold event in the Pacific Ocean, um, in the summer months, in our summer, uh, very often these are poor summers. They're uh, very often um, punctuated by low pressure, by cool conditions, by wet and windy weather. And of course, we know what happened in summer of 2007 when we got this transition from El Nino to La Nina taking place. It was a very wet summer indeed with a tremendous amount of flooding. So I've been keeping a close eye on what's been happening in the uh, Pacific Ocean over the past few months. This is how things were looking in March, at the start of March. And then we still had the signature of El Nino, but it was a rapidly uh, weakening one. We went through to the beginning of May, and this is how things were looking then. Notice a little bit of blue now starting to appear in the eastern part of the equatorial Pacific Ocean at the start of May. That's slightly colder than average uh, sea surface temperature anomalies. And the latest is this from the 26th of May with an expansion of those blue colours through the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. So clearly touches are trending downwards in the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, we are clearly out of El Nino, but are we going to La Nina? The, um, the depth of cold is not big enough 
uh, and it's not expansive enough, there's not enough of it there to say that, yes, we definitively are moving from Nino to Nina, that we are moving from warm to cold. Um, and that's what's causing me a lot of problems, because if you don't do the flip from El Nino to La Nina, and you don't always get uh, a La Nina following El Nino, sometimes you'll just go from El Nino back to Enso Neutral, and the effects of that are very different to the effects of if you're going from uh, Nino to Nina. So that's one of the things that's causing me a lot of problems at the moment, quite what's going on in the Pacific Ocean. If this was just a very quick transition from a warm event to a cold event in the equatorial Pacific, I have no problem with indicating or forecasting uh, a cool, wet, um, disturbed summer pattern. But because this is quite a sluggish transition, albeit we have um, seen fair expansion of cold temperature anomalies since the um, beginning of May to the end of May, uh, nevertheless, this, this is still a fairly slow and sluggish change from El Nino to La Nina, um, if indeed we are going into La Nina, there's not enough there to say, but yes, we are going into La Nina yet, but it's a slow change, and that's what's causing the problems. Now, if we do get this quick flip from El Nino to La Nina, this is how the reanalysis look, uh, looks. Um, our good friend James provided me with uh, a lot of reanalysis charts um, uh, for the summer updates that we've been doing. So this is taking together all all of the years back to 1950 that did the flip from El Nino to La Nina during the summer and this is how the 500 millibar heights look in those summers and well it's a very unsettled looking pattern isn't it we have all this ridging around Greenland on average remember there can be deviations to this but on average we get a lot of ridging in the Atlantic going up towards Greenland would we'll tend to stick a trough in over the central and western part of Europe and the jet stream of course goes south with that so it places us on the cool side of the jet and we tend to have a very unsettled and disturbed summer Pattern. So that is the implications of if you get the quick flip from Nino to Nina. But because it's happening so slowly and there's not enough uh, cold water in the extra Pacific yet to uh, de definitively confirm that we are going to a, a La Nina event, a cold event, it's just causing me a few problems um, in terms of this summer forecast. Now, the models are indicating a change towards La Nina. So, this is a CFS V2, and you'll uh, notice that uh, the black line here is where we've been in terms of the sea surface temperature anomalies in the actual Pacific Ocean, and the black dashed line here is where the model is forecasting us to go. The anomalies are, on, are along the side of the chart. Now, we are clearly going negative with the temperature anomaly in terms of the forecast. So, by the time we get through to uh, July and August, which is just here, we are down into negative territory. But, crucially, this is not going down into moderate or strong landing your territory. It's just going down into sort of very weak landing your territory around here, around um, half a degree, maybe one degree cooler than average. So it is a landing year. It is a cold event that CFSB2 is uh, predicting. But it isn't crashing. It's not collapsing, uh, such as we saw in 2007, for example, and again, maybe another example would be 1998, where we had a very um, dramatic flip from El Nino to La Nina. Jams Tech also is in agreement with CFSB2 in that it's predicting a change to La Nina. Yes, the red line here is the forecast, and that is going down into negative territory by the time we get through to the last stages of the year. We are in a La Nina, but again, it's only... Just a weak La Nina, not even getting uh, enough there to go towards a moderate La Nina event. So clearly the models are trending towards a weak La Nina, um, and they are seeing quite a quick flip from uh, how warm it was at the start of the year to where we get to by the time we're at the end of the summer and into the autumn. But 
it's just the fact that we're not dropping down into moderate or strong land in your territory that's causing me a few problems. So some of the years that went into a weak La Nina following an El Nino, we'll have a quick look at that with this chart. It's the cold and warm episodes by season uh, chart from uh, NOAA in America. One of the years that did this had a, uh, a weak La Nina following El Nino was 1954, the summer of 1954, this year just here. So there's the El Nino that took place in 1953 into the start of 1954. There's the La Nina that occurred through the middle and the last stages of 1954. And you notice it's generally quite weak there with those blue numbers. They are going down into uh, substantially negative numbers, sort of um, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.6. It was a weak La Nina that was occurring during 1954. That was a dreadful summer. It's one of the worst summers of the 20th century. However, another year that did this uh, just went from a, a El Nino to a weak La Nina was 1995. This year, just here, where we had El Nino, albeit quite a weak one, at the start of 1995. And then through the summer and into the autumn, we gradually trended a little bit more negative, finishing up at the end of 1995 with quite a weak uh, La Nina event. Actually, the summer of 1995 was generally um, a little bit uh, around the neutral territory. It was neither an El Nino or a, or a La Nina. But by the time we got through to the end of 1995, um, we went into a weak La Nina. Now, that was a very hot summer. It was the last sort of great drought summer that has occurred. Um, so the difference here that we're seeing between these years that are going from a weak, uh, going to a weak La Nina, it, again, causing me quite a few problems. If we was crashing into a moderate or a strong La Nina, it would be a very pronounced signal for a disturbed summer. But because we're just going into, probably going into a weak La Nina, it does make the summer forecast much more difficult. Something else that occurred during these summer updates was a pattern that we had in April. We had a very blocked um, type pattern in April uh, and I'm going to show you the reanalysis of that uh, right now. So this is how the 500 millibar height anomaly looks for April 2016 reanalyzed and you see that it was a very unusual pattern. It was a very blocked uh, pattern. Lots and lots of northern blocking occurring around Greenland with those red colours uh, just there. And then underneath it, of course, we have the trough, the cold trough, sitting underneath it around the UK and Western Europe. Now, you remember at the end of April, it did turn very cold for the time of year. Um, we didn't have a snow event. Um, that was just purely down to uh, good luck or bad luck, depending on uh, your point of view. But in terms of the temperature, normally it was a very cold end to April in 2016, occurring via all of this uh, northern blocking just here with the jet stream doing something like that. Now, although it's quite an unusual pattern that occurred in April 2016, there have been uh, past years that had uh, a similar pattern. So we have a look back uh, to uh, those years that had um, that kind of blocked pattern during April and uh, this is how uh, it looks. When you combine all of those years together there's quite a few of them uh, actually although I say overall it's quite an unusual pattern. But this is how when you combine all those uh, years it looks in terms of the 500 millibar heights with the ridge over uh, Greenland particularly but also backing towards the top of the North Pole as well and then the trough underneath it around western parts of Europe so you can see that April 2016 was fairly um, much what you'd expect in terms of the 500 millibar heights when you get this pattern albeit the pattern is quite unusual so from there we looked at what the summers were like in all of these years that had this unusual blocked cold April pattern and this is how the 500 millibar height anomaly looks for the summers of all of those years that have the cold blocking in April. And it's very striking how similar this is to the years that are doing the El Nino to La Nina flip. So very often following a cold blocked April, you will get a lot of ridging in the Atlantic and going back towards Greenland. And then you'll stick up this big trough over central and western parts of Europe, which sends the jet stream plunging to the south rather like that. 
And what's perhaps even more interesting is that many of the years here, and the years are listed on the side, many of the years that have this kind of thing going on in April and then an unsettled summer following it, many of those years are actually coinciding with the El Nino to La Nina flip. So there could well be some sort of relationship here between years that have the rapid transition from El Nino to La Nina and years that have cool block conditions in April, cold block conditions in April, and then a poor summer pattern. More research needs to be done, uh, really, than I've got time to do um, for this summer forecast. But there definitely appears to be some kind of relationship going on there between the Nino to Nino flip and the cold block pattern in April. And all years, whether it's doing the Nino to Nino flip or whether it's got the cold block pattern in April, they all seem to arrive at the same destination, which is a pretty cool and unsettled and poor summer. But there are deviations, aren't there always? So 1995 is in there, I was just looking at that. Um, that had quite a cold block pattern in April, but the summer actually wasn't bad. It was a very hot summer and a very dry summer as well. The seasonal models haven't been shedding much light on this either. The last model update showed a big split between the long-range models that are going for a mixed summer and the long-range models that are going for quite a warm, dry summer. So this, for example, is the Beijing Climate Centre, and it shows a very poor summer with a trough of low pressure centred around the UK, the jet stream on a southerly track. The temperature anomaly from the Beijing Climate Centre is coming out cooler or colder than average. Whereas the Jams Tech model is going for a much warmer summer. Look at this in those bright salmon pink colours there, indicating above average temperature anomalies, significantly above average temperature anomalies for this summer. And in terms of the precipitation anomaly, that's going for drier than average. So the Jams Tech is seeing a drier than average summer as well. So you can see the things that we're playing with for this summer. Uh, and if we was getting a very rapid transition to a what was going to be a moderate or strong La Nina, um, I would have no hesitation in going with the analogues uh, and forecasting a very poor summer. The problem with this is that we are going towards a weak La Nina, probably. Now, it's possible these models are actually underplaying the La Nina that's going to occur with, in something at the moment called the spring predictability barrier, which sort of prevents the models or um, holds back the models from getting the right, uh, the right forecast in terms of what's happening in the Ecuador Pacific Ocean. So that's something else to factor that the models could be downplaying the La Nina that's going to occur. Essentially, I need another month um, to see exactly what's going to happen in the Pacific Ocean, but I don't have another month. We're at the end of May, and I've got to come up with the forecast. So very tentatively, I'm going to predict quite an unsettled summer I think we're going to go to uh, La Nina, albeit it's going to be quite a weak one, probably. Um, so I'm going to say that the uh, summer as a whole, I think, is going to be quite unsettled. I'm not expecting a classic summer. I expect a classic summer. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but I think we're going to have quite a uh, un unsettled and mixed summer. I would expect temperature anomalies perhaps to come out a little bit above average, and that could be mainly down to the first half of June, because I think what's going to happen is that we'll have generally quite a warm start to the summer, and then we might get some sort of deterioration as we're going into the middle and second half of summer. So if you like, it could be a front-loaded summer, a fair amount of dry weather early on, and then probably a return of westerlies and more unsettled conditions later on. Um, so the summer overall, I think, comes out a little bit above average with the temperature anomaly, but expect quite a split between the early part, which could be significantly warmer, and the second half, which may even be a little bit cooler. Precipitation, that is very, very difficult to predict, but I would suspect we probably come out quite close to average again. We could have a drier first half being offset by a cooler second half. Now, if we don't go to La Nina, this forecast becomes uh, much more difficult. If we don't go to La Nina, if we just hover around Enso Neutral, then it's 
is possible, and this isn't what I'm forecasting, this isn't what Gazza is forecasting, but it's possible, if we just stay around neutral in the Pacific Ocean, that we might have a hot summer, and it could be a very hot summer. It could be really baking and very dry. Now, this isn't what I'm expecting. It's not what I'm forecasting, but I'm just throwing it out there just to keep it at the back of your mind that it's not beyond impossibility. It's not impossible that we could get a hot summer this year, and the chances of that are probably a little bit greater than they would normally be, uh, just because of what's happening in the Pacific. Um, so just keep that up the back of your mind. It isn't what we're forecasting. It's not what I'm expecting. But there's that small possibility, probably no more around 5 or 10%, that we might finish up with a baking hot summer. But the Gazwevis.com summer 2016 forecast is for near normal temperatures, a little bit above average, and near normal rainfall, maybe erring a little bit on the drier side with rainfall. But expect the first half to be significantly warmer, and then the second half to be cooler. If the landing your flip doesn't occur, then the second half could continue as the first half is likely to be generally quite warm. So I hope you were able to follow all that. It's a very, very challenging and difficult forecast to get together this one. I've really struggled with it. This is the best that I can do. Um, so I hope you're able to follow it. We'll see how it goes. As ever, we will evaluate this forecast as we get to the end of the season. I don't sort of moderate the forecast or change it as we go along. I just put the forecast out there and then leave it alone. And at the end of season, we see how we did. So it'll be very interesting, I think, to come back at the end of August, start of September, and see how this forecast went. I think it's going to be a very interesting summer, whatever happens. I'm expecting some quite unusual things to be taking place this summer. So it's not going to be uh, a boring summer, I don't think. So um, that's it. The, uh, the train, I say, rolls on from here to autumn updates. That's where we're going in terms of the longer range at Gazovis over the coming three months. So we'll start off with that later on this afternoon by having a quick sneak peek at... Um, at uh, autumn uh and that'll be coming up this afternoon tomorrow bank holiday monday we'll be doing the um historic video it'll look at the winters of the mid-1950s 1954 1955 1956 follows on from what we did uh on may day bank holiday monday where we looked at the summers of the mid-1950s this will look at the winters. That's it for now. Thanks so much uh, for following the summer updates over the past three months. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in to the summer 2016 forecast uh, today. A uh, big thank you to James, who's uh, supplied us with all of the reanalysis that we've looked at over the past three months. Um, and remember, if you want to see any of the long-range models, you can find a link to those on the links page. This video will be placed on the summer updates and forecast page with a written summary, uh, so you haven't been able to watch it all in one go. It'll be kept at the website indefinitely, as will the written summary that's going to go with it. That's it for now, and uh, thanks for watching. Come back later on for the autumn sneak peek. Bye for now.